The Time Machine by H. G. Wells With Robert Glenister and William Gaunt This is the BBC Home Service And now reshaping man's heritage Biology in the Service of Man Tonight, in the first in a new series of broadcasts The eminent writer H. G. Wells asks the British people To continue to look ahead with hope Even in these darkest of times I don't ask you to prepare for a new world, because I realize that a new world is here now. The question is whether our species, we, our children and our children's children, can adapt ourselves and conquer the new world. Uh, pardon me, is this Portland Place? Oh no, madam. It's at Marlebone High Street. Portland Place is the other side of Harley Street. Oh, thank you. I must have missed a turning. Oh, easy thing to do in a blackout, madam. Whether we are going to spin down this vortex to extinction. Extinction which has been the fate of all the mighty races of animals that have lorded it over the world in the past. Uh, good evening. I'm here to meet Mr. Wells. Uh, he hasn't finished his broadcast yet, madam. Oh. Can you let him know I'm here? It's Martha. Oh, certainly, madam. What briefly is this new world, this new state of affairs that confronts mankind? There is no choice before mankind. There's someone called Martha waiting for him downstairs, sir. One of his young ladies, eh? Yes, sir. He's nearly finished. There's a cab waiting for him. ...scrapping of our inheritance of hates and aggressions that began less than a thousand generations ago, when wars began. We have to nerve ourselves for that. There is no other way for us. Playing the prophet again, H.G. This war is driving me to despair. But even with one foot in the grave, I still feel I have to kick out at everything. <laughs> I would expect no less of you. Hello, the terrace, sir. Yes, number 13, please. Now, Martha, we'll have dinner, and then I'm afraid you'll have to come up on the roof with me. I'm fire-watching tonight. It's the middle of winter, H.G. <laughs> we'll wrap up warm. It's a clear night. That's not good. Bomber's moon. Indeed. Folks back home have no idea, you know, how bad it is. Oh, and it's your job to let them know. Most people prefer to float half-hidden, even from themselves, in a rich, warm, buoyant, juicy mass of familiar <laughs> make-believe. And you've spent 50 years trying to pull the plug on that. And tonight, my dear Martha, I look out on London and wonder whether any of it has made any difference at all. Perhaps I... What? Perhaps I should have shocked them with more truth. H.G., you prided yourself on that. <laughs> With my very first success, my time machine, I allowed myself to be persuaded not to make the ending of humanity too shocking for my readers. But everyone knew that was a fantasy. Was it? Perhaps that young fellow that I was back in the 80s really did know a time traveler. What are you saying, H.G.? Ah, the hard-nosed journalist sense a story. I fear this one will be too fantastic for your taste, my dear. Try me. It was during my student days at the normal school of science in Kensington. There was a fellow who used to come and sit in on some of the lectures. According to Huxley, he had been a brilliant student, but his researches took him into areas that the college authorities considered too arcane to support. I was an impressionable young fellow and open to new ideas, and so it was that one evening I found myself at a gathering at his home in Richmond, where he talked to us about the possibility of travelling through time. He showed us a model of a mechanism that he had made to travel through time, and before our very eyes he made it disappear. Uh, yes, I recall this from the story. But I failed to mention that it was my finger that pressed the lever that sent this mechanism into the future. And then, I suppose, he revealed to you that he had a full-size version that he was about to complete? Indeed. 
one in which he meant to journey on his own account. I fear that the docks may be in for a pounding tonight. And did you believe him? I think none of us quite believed him. At any rate, the following week I returned to his house in Richmond. Ah, oh, now. It's Mr. Wells, isn't it? Yes, Mrs. Watchett. There were another two gentlemen waiting in the dining room, but I'm afraid the master of the house is detained. Is he not at home? He's been in his laboratory all day. Told me not to disturb him on any account. But well, you see, Mr. Wells, I've prepared mutton. They don't like his meat overcooked. It is, sir. Uh, no, it's not him. It's our sociolistic student. Hello there, Wells. Hello, Bennett. Philby. Evening, Wells. Is there still no sign of our friend, Mrs. Watches? I'm afraid not, Mr. Philby. It's a little inconsiderate of him. He did invite us for seven. Bennett's stomach has been rumbling, Mrs. W. Mm. And this delicious wine is making him even more nonsensical than usual. He's been telling me all sorts of tosh about what happened here last week. Oh, come, come, Philby. So perhaps you ought to serve dinner as our friend instructed? If you say so, Mr. Philby, but I'm not happy about it. <laughs> oh dear, he'll be for it when he does get here. Where can he have got to? Perhaps he's time travelling. Dinner was served, and in the course of it, I had to explain my remark to Philby, who had not been present at the disappearance of the model mechanism the previous Thursday. It was scarcely larger than a mantel clock and very delicately made. What was it made of? There was ivory in it and some sort of transparent crystalline substance. And you really want me to believe that it disappeared in front of your eyes? Oh, this mutton is delicious. It suddenly swung round and became indistinct, became ghost-like for a second, and yes, then it was gone. Well, he's a damn clever fellow. Obviously some sort of sleight of hand. Yes, that's what I thought. Uh, I was at the fair at Hampstead last month, and there was an illusionist there who cut a young girl absolutely... <laughs> Well, uh, he is at last. Good heavens, man, what's the matter? Wine. Here. Well, what on earth have you been up to, man? Oh. Don't let me disturb you, I'm all right. Would you mind? Of course. Oh, that's good. I'm going to wash and dress, and then I'll come down and explain things. I'll be all right in a minute. Did you see his feet? No shoes. They were bleeding. Well, you won't be catching me travelling into the future. They don't even seem to have clothes brushes there. <laughs> Philby heaped ridicule on the whole thing, and the dinner was resumed. There was a man in Philadelphia at the end of the last century. He claimed to have experienced time travel when electrocuted. Victor Tesla. <clears throat> was he the inspiration for the story, H.G.? Perhaps. Or perhaps it happened in Richmond to my friend. When the time traveller came back, he was dressed in ordinary evening clothes. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, gentlemen. Oh. Where's my mutton? What a treat it is to stick a fork into meat again. Over a week without meat takes its toll. This is what you'd had you on a diet. Well, we had that excellent pork only last Thursday. Have you been time travelling, friend? Wells has told me all about your disappearing machine. How did you do it? I assure you. I was in my laboratory at four this afternoon, and since then I've lived eight days. Ah, but I want something to eat. I won't say a word until I get some peptone into my arteries. Eat, my friend, eat. Uh, more wine? Mm. The rest of the dinner was uncomfortable. Sudden questions kept on rising to my lips. But at last he pushed his plate away, and he led us next door to the smoking room. It's over 50 years ago, but I can still see his white, sincere face in the bright circle of the little lamp. We, his hearers, were in shadow, for the candles had not yet been lighted. I was expecting to finish the machine yesterday, but at the last moment I discovered that one of the nickel bars was exactly one inch too short. So it was not until this morning at ten o'clock that the first of all time machines began its career. Listen, friend, you're holding on to those matches as if they were the crown jewels. How about passing them on so I can light this thing? Um, I'm sorry. Here. I should tell you that I took another of my inventions with me. A little box strapped to my chest which contains a zinc disc coated with beeswax and benzene. 
A needle sensitive to the vibrations of sound waves scratches a record of those sounds onto the disc, which can afterwards be transmitted in the manner of a phonograph. Hmm. I intended to use it to record my thoughts and impressions and to bring back the sounds and voices of the future. We can listen to them. Well, I have yet to process the discs. So tonight, you will have to be satisfied with my own verbal account. I suppose a suicide who holds a pistol to his skull feels much the same wonder at what will come next as I felt as I took the starting lever in one hand and the stopping one in the other, pressed the one and then the other almost immediately. Looking round, I saw the laboratory exactly as before. Had anything happened? Then I noted the clock. A moment before, it had stood at a minute past ten. Now... It was nearly half past three. God gracious. I drew a breath, set my teeth, gripped the starting lever with both hands and went off with a thud. The laboratory got hazy and went dark. Mrs. Watchett came in and walked without appearing to see me towards the garden door. She seemed to shoot across the room like a rocket. I pressed the lever to its extreme position. Night coming like the turning out of a lamp. Now almost immediately day. Laboratory faint, black. Tomorrow night, now day again. Night and day faster and faster, like the flapping of a black wing. The hands on the dials that register my speed are racing round faster and faster. Laboratory falling away, sun hopping swiftly across the sky. Laboratory destroyed, hurts the eyes. Faster now, hands on the dials are blur. 50,000 years, 60,000 years. Just one continuous grey. Sky, wonderful deep blue. Sun-like streak of fire across it. Moon, a fainter band fluctuating. Landscape, misty, vague. No, huge buildings rising up, now passing like dreams. Dials going round faster and faster. Great and splendid architecture now, massive. But now, everything green again. So beautiful. No seasons. Ah, main concern. Something else occupying this space at the time I choose to stop. Consequences, matter meets matter. Explosion. I can never stop. Have to carry on forever. Nauseous and swaying of machine. Have to stop. Machine has fallen over. We'll record impressions. I'm lying on the ground. Grassy turf, some sort of lawn, perhaps. Um, I hope this device is still recording me. In clement weather, fine hospitality to a man who has travelled innumerable years to see you. Rhododendron bushes. I'm getting soaked. Some sort of colossal statue carved in white stone, visible through the hailstones. Storm abating. Statue. Sphinx with outspread wings. White marble, massive pedestal. Bronze, perhaps, thick with verdigris. What are you, eh? Sightless eyes watching me. I can now discern other vast shapes. Huge buildings, parapets, columns. Curious sense of my own temerity. What if man has become inhuman, cruel? Unsympathetic. What might I seem to them? An old world savage. A foul creature to be slain. I have to leave here. Come on. I, I, I'm endeavouring to set time machine upright again. That's got it. Well, at least I can get away now. Hello? People approaching through the bushes. Uh, hello? I think it's a man. Hello? He's about four feet high, very slight, purple tunic, no hat, bare legs, sandals. 
I'm a friend. Friend? Fragile beauty like a consumptive. Friend? Hi, Dan Lau, Kana, Ben Privy Chudato. Hi, Benny. Quablitzen. Friend. Ben Tastali. Kana, Kana, Yarifika. One of these fellows is coming towards me now, holding up my hand. Yes, that's right. Uh, he's touched my hand. Which seems to be giving the others the courage to... Uh, <laughs> that tickles. <laughs> They're like Dresden China dolls. Very delicate, frail. But they don't seem threatening, so in the interests of science, I will stay to investigate. No, please don't touch the machine. That's, that's my machine. I'm now taking the precaution of unscrewing the starting and stopping levers. I come from the past. A past, time, sun, travels through the sky. Um, time. Ah, thunder, yes, very good, very realistic. The fellow's pointing to the sun. Seems to be asking me if I have come from the sun in a thunderstorm. Oh, dear. I seem to have come all this way through time only to find that man has the intellectual capacity of a five-year-old child. Yes, um, thunder... Quacello. Murga. Murga. The woman is bringing a garland. Flowers. Murga. Murga. Frumos. 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 Thank you. She's putting a chain of exquisite flowers around my neck. Yata. Quacca diri. I'm coming. They seem to want to take me into the building. Sitting here with you now in front of this fire, it seems almost a dream. Yeah. <laughs> Seen through a haze of cigar smoke. They led me through a huge, richly carved arch. I fancied I saw suggestions of old Phoenician decorations. The doorway opened into a great hall, which was strangely dilapidated. The stained glass windows were broken in many places and the curtains were thick with dust. Oh, you should have taken Mrs. Watchett with you. She wouldn't have tolerated such desultory housekeeping. <laughs> I was drawn to one of the innumerable tables upon which were heaped fruits, which, with the exception of a kind of hypertrophied raspberry and orange, I was unable to recognise. These people of the future were strict vegetarians, and while I was with them, I had to be frugivorous also. Now, that would have been testing. So, as soon as my appetite was a little checked, I determined to make a resolute attempt to learn the speech of these new men of mine. And this? Frumos. Yes, it's lovely, but what is it? Mir. Ha! No, 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 don't go away. I want to learn. You teach me. This, it's like an orange in my world. Portocola. Ah, no. Portocola. Ah. Mergo. Chocana. Chocana. Mergo. No, no, please don't go. I want to learn. My little hosts Mier. seem so childlike. Portocola. And a queer thing I discovered about them was their lack of interest. I went out through the portal into the sunlit world again. They would come to me with eager cries of astonishment. But like children, they would soon stop examining me and wander away after some other toy which allowed me freedom to record my observations into my machine. The scene was lit by the warm glow of the setting sun. The big building I had left was situated on the slope of a broad river valley, but the Thames had shifted perhaps a mile from its present position. Extraordinary. I wanted to get a wider view of the planet of that time, and so I resolved to mount the summit of a crest, perhaps a mile and a half away. What was it, the hill here at Richmond? A distant descendant of that hill, my friend. If the dials on my machine were to be believed, I had fetched up in the year 802,701. Oh, oh, good Lord. Day one. Everything is in a state of ruinous splendour. I've just come across a great heap of granite bound together with aluminium, some sort of vast labyrinth of precipitous walls, evidently the derelict remains of some vast structure. Here and there among the greenery, there are other palace-like buildings. I realised then 
that there were no small houses to be seen. Apparently the single house and even the household had vanished. It's communism. And on the heels of that came another thought. I looked at the half dozen little figures that were following me. They all have the same soft, hairless visage and the same girlish rotundity of limb. Clearly, the differentiation of the sexes has ceased. While I was musing on these things, my attention was attracted by a pretty little structure which I approached. It resembles a well and is covered by a sort of cupola. Odd that wells should still exist. Gore! Gore! What's that? Gore! Well, what's wrong, my fellow? It seemed to trouble them that I was looking into the well. It was almost as if I had insulted them. Um, proceeding to climb the hill. The little people that have been following me are falling back. At the crest, I found a seat of some yellow metal. The armrests cast and filed into the resemblance of Griffin's heads. I sat down on it and surveyed the broad view of our old world under the sunset of that long day. Below was the valley of the Thames, in which the river lay like a band of burnished steel. There were no hedges, no sign of proprietary rights, no evidence of agriculture. The whole earth has become a garden. The air was free from gnats, the earth from weeds or fungi. Everywhere there were fruits and sweet, delightful flowers. Brilliant butterflies flew hither and thither, and the ruddy sunset set me thinking of the sunset of mankind. Ah, <sighs> this is clearly mankind upon the wane. Humanity has used all its vitality to alter the conditions under which it lived. No danger of war here or solitary violence. No danger from wild beasts. Seemingly no disease, no need to toil. And so physical and intellectual power are out of place. This explains the physical slightness of the people here, their lack of intelligence. The full moon, yellow and gibbous, came up in the northeast. <sighs> now, where am I going to sleep tonight? I determined to descend, and I looked for the building I knew. Then my eye travelled along to the figure of the white sphinx upon the pedestal of bronze. There was the tangle of rhododendron bushes, and there was the little lawn. I looked at the lawn again. No. That can't be the lawn. Where's the... It is the lawn, but where... No. No! No! The time machine was gone. At once, like a lash across the face, came the possibility of being stranded there in a different age. They've moved it a little. They've pushed it under the bushes, out of the way. Of being left helpless in this strange new world. Oh. Oh, damnation! How could I have... When I reached the lawn, my worst fears were realised. I ran towards the bushes. It has to be here. I had taken the levers to prevent anyone from travelling through time. No! What was that? I had startled some pale animal that in the dim light I took for a small deer. No! Where is it? What have you done with it? What have you done with my machine? Where are you? Give it back to me. Give me my machine! In the light of my match, I went past a dusty curtain and found a second great hall covered with cushions. Wake up! I have no doubt they found my appearance strange enough holding the flame, for they had forgotten about such things as matches. Where is my time machine? Where is it? Where is my machine? Where is my machine? Your children! Useless! You're useless! Get out of my way! I went back out under the moonlight. I can't stay here. I can't. I have a memory of horrible fatigue as the long night of despair wore away. Of groping among moonlit ruins and touching strange creatures in the black shadows. 
At last, I lay on the ground near the Sphinx. I had nothing left but misery. And then I slept. I sat up in the freshness of morning, trying to remember how I had got there. But with the plain and reasonable daylight, I could look my circumstances fairly in the face. My frenzy last night was folly. I must learn the way of the people. Probably the machine has only been taken away. We'll make a careful examination of the ground about the little lawn. Ah, Giudato. Hi, hi. Hi. Machine, where? Qua, qua. <laughs> Magie, qua. <laughs> Oh. I had the hardest task in the world to keep my hands off their pretty laughing faces. However, the turf gave better counsel. Appears to be a groove ripped in the lawn and sign of strange narrow footprints of an animal like a sloth leading to pedestal of sphinx. Deep framed bronze panels on either side of plinth. Hmm, clearly hollow, no handles or keyholes. Perhaps it could be opened from within. One thing was clear enough to my mind. My time machine was inside that pedestal. Hi. Hi. This. What is it? Their response was one of shock. Suppose you were to use a grossly improper gesture to a delicate-minded woman. It is how she would look. Did they tell you what was inside the pedestal? No, no, no. They went off as if they had received the last possible insult, as I continued to knock on the bronze panels. <laughs> Who's in there? Hi! Hi! I got a big stone from the river and hammered, but nothing came of it. The delicate little people stood in crowds on the slopes looking furtively at me. Finally, I gave up. I realised that I would have to adopt a different strategy. If I was to regain my machine, I must face this world, learn their ways, learn the language, and maybe then I could find out who had taken the machine and why. All those years working to come here, and now all this anxiety to get away. <laughs> what a trap I've made for myself. <laughs> Day two. Have to find a way into the pedestal and have decided to be patient. I will learn the language whilst at the same time pursuing my explorations of this world. The little people seem to have got over their shock at my behaviour. I began to make what progress I could in the language, which was excessively simple, and started to investigate the function of the circular wells. Hmm. Rimmed with bronze, protected by cupola from the rain. <coughs> Match flares, suggesting the steady current of air flowing into the shaft. Ah, a piece of paper sucked down swiftly out of sight. Hmm. Extensive system of subterranean ventilation, perhaps linked to sanitary apparatus of these people. Hmm, most likely. Gentlemen, I am forgetting my role as host. Your glasses are empty. Here. Ah, oh, oh, nice. I do continue, old fellow. You're spinning a great yarn. Yes, tell us more about these wells. Did you discover their function? Sewage system, no doubt. One thing that puzzled me was that aged and infirm among these people were their none. Hmm. I could see no signs of crematoria or anything suggestive of tombs. Perhaps they'd eradicate a death in your future. Neither could I find machinery or appliances of any kind. Yet these people were clothed in pleasant fabrics that must at times need renewal. Mm. There were no shops, no workshops, no sign of importations. They spent all their time in eating, playing, bathing in the river and making love in a half-playful fashion. Somewhere we'd all like to visit then, eh, Wills? <laughs> Indeed. On the morning of my third day, I was awakened at about dawn. I had been restless, dreaming most disagreeably that I was drowned and that sea anemones were feeling over my face with their soft palps. Hmm? What? What is it? What? what? Who's there? 
It was that dim grey hour when things are just creeping out of the darkness. I got up and went out onto the flagstones in front of the palace. Oh, the bushes, inky black, ground, sombre grey, sky colourless. Up the hill, white figures. <laughs> like ghosts, white, ape-like. Um, more there, several of them carrying something. Some sort of body. No. Gone. Trick of the light. <laughs> it's getting lighter now. No sign of them. Creatures of the half-light like that animal I saw in the bushes that first night. Hmm. Later that day, I sat on the banks of the river watching some of the little people bathing in the shallows. I felt I lacked a clue. Day three. Something, I know not what, has taken my time machine into the hollow pedestal of the Sphinx. Why? Those waterless wells, what is their function? It is as if I had found an inscription with sentences here and there in plain English. One of the little people seems to have got out of a depth, interpolated with others made up of words and letters unknown to me. Hey there! Hi! Yata! Yata! They're completely ignoring her. Help her! Ajuta la! She's floating downstream. They're not going to help her. Ajuta la! <laughs> they don't seem to care. I hurriedly waded in at a point lower down. Uh, I'll help you. Yes. Let, let's get you on land. Uh. Hurts. Your foot. I am um, cramp. Let me. Yata. <laughs> I'm a good man, am I? <laughs> I am. Um, I have to get my clothes. I had got such a low estimate of her kind that I did not expect gratitude from her, and I spent the rest of the morning exploring the surrounding country. However, on my return, I met my little woman. Ciudato! Ciudato! Oh, hello. Bona taga. Bona mi taga. And morga, Kali? Flowers for me. Morga for me. For me? <laughs> no, not for you. For me. <laughs> ha, for me. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Frumos. Frumos. Malta Danka. Vilbusali. <laughs> oh. Busa. Kiss. Malta Danka. Very possibly I had been feeling desolate. I suppose I was missing human companionship. At any rate, I did my best to display my appreciation of the gift. Marufa Wina. Wina? Ah. Lovely name. Frumos. Oh, ciudato barbato frumos. Me? No. Wina frumos. Oh. <laughs> Wina is beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Oh. Ciudato beautiful. <laughs> she was exactly like a child and tried to follow me when I went out exploring again. Ciudato! Stepta! Stepta! But the problems of the world had to be mastered. I had not come into the future to carry on a miniature flirtation. No, you stay, Wiener. Oh, Ciudato! Nevertheless, she was somehow a great comfort. And that evening I watched for her tiny, doll-like figure as soon as I came back over the hill. Wiener! 
Hai! Hai! It was from her too that I learned that fear had not totally left the world. At night, the little people gathered into the great houses and slept in droves, but I insisted upon sleeping away from these slumbering multitudes. Ciudato, vina qua vina. No, Wina, I sleep out here. Ciudato, gore. 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 Darkness. Darkness. Vina qua vina. Why are you scared of the dark? Vin. Vin. No, I'm staying here. Ciudato. Ciudato qua gore. Darkness. She dreaded the dark. Dreaded shadows. Dreaded black things. Yet I was still such a blockhead that I missed the lesson of that fear. I'm staying out here. We sat there in the light of the dying fire, watching the time traveler relive these moments as he recounted them. A pained expression came into his face, and I could have sworn that tears gathered in his eyes. Guilt. Perhaps. We all have that for the pain we have inflicted on others. And yet, better to have loved. It's such a slow process, isn't it? What is? The education and persuasion of humanity. All my life I have believed that in the end, reason will triumph. Instead, mankind seems bent on destruction. Your patient is refusing your medicine. The race is between education and catastrophe. At the moment, catastrophe seems to have won that race. If your time traveler is to be believed, then reason does eventually triumph. For a while. Only for a while? He saw what came after the decline of reason. As I looked at him that night, I could see that his experiences had had a profound effect on my friend. To regain composure, he stood to add another log to the fire, and spark shot out onto the hearth rug. Uh, careful, old chap, we have the house on fire. So why was she so afraid? Did you find out? Patience, Bennett, patience. What were these mysterious white creatures that you saw? I'm coming to that. <clears throat> He sat back down in his chair, his composure regained, and returned to the future and his tale. The weather of this golden age was much warmer than our own, and on the morning of my fourth day I was seeking shelter from the heat and glare in the granite ruin which I came across on my first evening. I found a narrow gallery, which seemed at first impenetrably dark to me. Windows here are blocked by masses of fallen stone. A pair of eyes was watching me out of the darkness. The old instinctive dread of wild beasts came upon me. Then I remembered Weena's strange dread of the dark. I'm taking step forward. Hi. Hi. I put out my hand and touched something soft. Something white ran past me and was hidden in a black shadow beneath another pile of masonry. Ape-like creature, dull white, large, greyish, red eyes, flaxen hair on head and down its back. Runs with head held down and forearms held low or even on all fours, can't be sure. I followed it, and could not find it at first, but after a time came upon one of those round, well-like openings. Looking down, I saw a small white creature with large, bright eyes, which regarded me steadfastly as it retreated. It was so like a human spider. It was clambering down the wall by means of a number of metal foot and hand rests. Ah, damnation. It's gone. Disappeared. I do not know how long I sat peering down that well. <laughs> I know it's dark down there. What is the creature that lives down there? What is it that lives in the door? Come back! 
Gradually, the truth dawned on me. The Eloi, as they called themselves, were not our sole descendants. This bleached, obscene, nocturnal thing was also our heir. <laughs> you mean these things were human? Yes. Man had not remained one species, but had differentiated into two distinct animals. Oh. <sighs> the social difference between the capitalist and the labourer in our time is key to the whole thing. This is beginning to sound very much like the sort of propaganda that our friend Wells hears. Uh, consider about. how our present circumstances point that way. There is a tendency to utilise underground space for the less ornamental purposes of civilization. You mean such as the Metropolitan Railway here in London? Electric railways, subways, underground workrooms and restaurants. Evidently, this tendency had increased till industry had gradually gone deeper and deeper into ever larger underground factories. You show great talents as a creator of fiction, my friend. Is it so incredible? Of course it is, Wells. But even now, does not an East End worker live in such artificial conditions as to be practically cut off from the natural surface of the earth? Oh, don't let him start off. Considerable on portions of the surface of the land are being closed to the poor, which creates a widening gulf between them and the rich. At present, the exchange between class and class through intermarriage retards the dividing of our species. But, but if this widening of the gulf continues, is it so fantastic to imagine a time when a split occurred? <laughs> That's it, Wells. Those are the conclusions towards which I fumbled as I sat there at the edge of that well. In the end, above ground must exist the one species pursuing pleasure and comfort and beauty. The haves, and below ground the have-nots. Mm. The workers getting continually adapted to the conditions of their labour. The future world you're painting for us seems merely to be confirming for Wells all his prejudices. It is the most plausible explanation. Mm -hmm. But the balanced civilization that resulted must have long since passed its zenith and was now far fallen into decay. The too perfect security of the upper worlders had led them to a slow movement of degeneration, a dwindling in size, strength and intelligence. And was it these creatures from the underworld who had taken your time machine? I was sure of it. I see a fault, though, in the fabric of your fiction, old fellow. Why did your little people not restore your time machine? They were, after all, the masters. And why were they so afraid of the dark? That night I asked myself exactly the same questions and tried to elicit answers from my little woman. Wina? Ha, Chudato? Qua gore? No, Chudato. No darkness. But why, Wina? Mm. What are you afraid of? Mm. Qua vin frica? Oh, Eloi yar frica gornici nopts. Eloi have a fear of the dark nights. Mm. Dark nights. Moonless nights. Perhaps. Weena. Huh? Tell me about the people down there. Down tell me there. about them. Mm. Um, um. Oh, Morlocky! Morlocky! Morlocks? Are they the creatures down there? Morlocky Quagor? Har, Morlocky Quagor! It's, it's oh. all right, it's all right. I'm here. I'll protect you. Here, Yata. That's a match. Sarufa match. Matcha. From Osika match. No, don't touch it. It's hot. Hot? Oh, ah, ah. <laughs> I'm funny, am I? Yoi Risiba. Much formosa. Yareka Orba. Yes. The flame is like the sun. Galben, Galben Orba Yar. Try per ilo habos par. Yata. I know this tune. Oh. Let me switch on my machine. Hmm? There. Sing it. La Lanka. Oh, I... 
In Galbain, Galbain, or by yellow, I yellow is the sun. Try per Eloy Carabos, shine on the Eloy so we can enjoy galbain, ourselves. Galbain, 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 yellow, yellow, yellow it is. Or Galbain, Eloy, pa. the yellow sun gives the Eloy joy. Mm. Frumos, Judato oh. Kunos, Judato oh. knows this. Tune. Oh, what you dat on la lanka? <laughs> I can't sing. Huh? Galben, 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 ha ha. Or by ya, ha. Try per iloi carabos par ya. Galben, Galben, or by ya, ha. Chudato. Try per iloi carabos par. It was to be two days before I followed up on what I had discovered. I felt a peculiar shrinking from those pallid bodies. They were the half-bleached colour of worms and filthily cold to the touch. Day five. Have been exploring in the direction of 19th century Banstead. In the distance, I observed a vast green structure, larger than the largest ruins that I have seen hitherto. The facade had a bluish-green tint of a certain kind of Chinese porcelain. I have resolved to return there tomorrow. <laughs> yes, Weena. <laughs> I'm home. Ah, Judato home. Home, Clarina. Yes. Home with Wiener. <laughs> the next morning, I perceived clearly that my curiosity regarding the Palace of Green Porcelain was a piece of self-deception to enable me to shirk by another day an experience I dreaded. The time machine was only to be recovered by boldly penetrating those underground mysteries. So I started out in the early morning towards a well near the ruins of granite and aluminium. Weena followed me as usual, blissfully unaware of my plan. It's all right, I'll be back. Day six. I'm standing by one of the wells and I'm about to climb down. Match is ready just in case. Here I go. Goodbye, Weena. No, Weena. I have to go down. Tiring work. Legs and arms tiring. Must continue. Oh, there's a, there's a small tunnel to my right. I'll try to hold myself in. soft hand had touched my face. Three stooping white creatures were hastily retreating before the light. Their eyes were abnormally large and sensitive, and I had no doubt that they could see me in the darkness. Can I, Yarefrika? Their language was apparently different from that of the upper world people. I'm going to proceed. Even now, all my instincts are urging me to get out of this place. Feeling my way along the tunnel. Presently, I came to a large open space. I'm in a vast arched cavern. Big machines. More locks sheltering the shadows from the glare of my match. 
strange smell like like freshly shed blood uh, can make out a table made of white metal laid with some sort of meal meat they eat meat joint from some sort of animal raw red it was all very indistinct the heavy smell the obscene figures lurking in the shadows only waiting for darkness to come at me again then the match burned down just four left I have thought since how ill-equipped I was for such an experience. No arms, no medicines, no tobacco, not even enough matches. I had wasted almost half the box in astonishing the upper worlders. No! Leave me! Leave me! Leave me! Seeking out the flame with a scrap of paper in my pocket. Retreating to the tunnel. Oh. Light blown out. No, get off me! Leave me! Hands clutching me, trying to hold me back. Uh, I must get out. Matches! Matches! Get off! They look so inhuman. Pale, chinless faces and great, lidless, pinkish grey eyes. I had to get out. I found tunnel. I'm crawling along tunnel. Creatures not far behind. Match still burning. Match gone out. Ah, here's the shaft. Must find the iron rungs. I felt sideways for the projecting bars. My feet were grasped from behind, and I was violently tugged backwards. Match gone out. My last one. I've had a bar. I'm putting myself in the shaft. You're there down there. Watching. There's one following. Little wretch. Nearly had my boot. Her head swimming. Mustn't fall. Just a few more yards. Feeling faint. Uh, uh, uh. Weena. Uh, Weena. Uh, it's all right. Uh, it, uh, I'm home. My hope of escape was staggered by these new discoveries. There was something inhuman and malign about the Morlocks. Instinctively, I loathed them. Come. What is it, Mrs. Watchett? I was wondering if you were going to be long, sir. You carry on, Mrs. Watchett. I'll see my guests out. That doesn't seem right, sir. I'm perfectly capable of doing it. Good night, then, gentlemen. Good night, Mrs. Watson. I felt like a beast in a trap, whose enemy would come upon him soon. And that enemy was these Morlocks. The enemy was the darkness of the new moon. The moon was on the wane. Each night there was a longer interval of darkness. Now I understood what Weena had meant by the dark nights. I wondered what foul villainy the Morlocks might do under the new moon. But why would the Eloy fear them if they were the master race? They might once have been the favoured aristocracy, and the Morlocks their mechanical servants. But that time had long passed away. Ages ago, man had thrust his brother man out of the ease and the sunshine. And now that brother was coming back. Exactly, Wells. The Morlocks continue to maintain the Eloy in their habitual needs. 
and I inferred that they made their clothes. Why would they do that? Out of habit, perhaps. Perhaps. But I was struck by the fact that the Eloy had begun to learn one old lesson anew. They were becoming reacquainted with fear. Ah. Suddenly there came into my head the memory of the meat I had seen in the underworld. It seemed odd how it floated into my mind. What are you saying, old fellow? I shuddered with horror to think how these Morlocks must have already examined me as I slept. It will give us nightmares, old man. I determined to make myself a weapon of some sort and to find a fastness where I might sleep. Day six. I've wandered along the valley of the Thames all afternoon, but have found nothing that commends itself to my mind as inaccessible. The Morlocks are dexterous climbers. I've decided to strike out for the Palace of Green Porcelain with its tall pinnacles and polished walls. <laughs> Come, Weena. I'll carry you on my shoulders. <laughs> well, you like it up there. Now, careful, my sweet. Don't kick. You'll damage my recording machine. Going up the hills to the southwest. The heel of one of my shoes is loose. And a nail is working its way through the sole, which is making me lame. I estimate the distance to the palace to be about seven or eight miles. <laughs> That's right. Eight miles. <laughs> After a time, Weena desired me to let her down and ran along by the side of me, occasionally darting off to pick flowers to stick in my pockets. Oh, we can't go home. We're going there. Can you see? To the green building. You're sleepy. I'll carry you again. As the hush of the evening crept over the world, we proceeded over the hill towards Wimbledon. One star after another came out, and the ground grew dim and the trees black. Wina yara frika. Shh. Kana ya frika. So far, I had seen nothing of the Morlocks, but it was yet early in the night, and the darker hours were to come. From the brow of the next hill, I saw a thick wood spreading before me. I decided that I would not face it, but would pass the night on the open hill. <sighs> Above us shone the stars. The Milky Way was still the same tattered streamer of stardust as of yore. No need to be afraid, Kana Frika. <laughs> I'll sing you a song from my time. Chudato La Lanka. You'll recognize the tune, I think. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky, in the dark blue sky. Through that long night, I held my mind off the Morlocks as well as I could. I thought of the great fear the Eloy felt for them. With a sudden shiver came the clear knowledge of what the meat I had seen might be. Yet it was too horrible. I looked at little Weena sleeping now beside me, her face white under the stars. Lights the traveller in the dark. No doubt I dozed at times. Dawn came at last, and no Morlocks had approached us. I stood up. Ow! My foot was swollen at the ankle, 
and painful under the heel. So I sat down again, took off my shoes, and flung them away. Uh, day seven. Unable to escape the realization that came to me last night about the meat that I saw. Clearly, at some time in the long ago, the Morlocks' food ran short. The Eloy are fatted cattle which the Morlocks preserve and prey upon. Ciudato. Buna Morgana. Ah, Wiener. Buna Morgana. Oh, Fuama, Ciudato. Fuama? Yes, yes, let's. Let's find some breakfast. I had very vague ideas as to the course I should pursue. I should secure some safe place of refuge and make myself arms of metal or stone, then procure fire so that I should have the weapon of a torch in my hand. Then I had to break open the doors of bronze in the plinth of the Sphinx. Wiener I had resolved to bring with me into our own time. Good grief, man. What would you have done with her if you'd got her here? She would have been a latter-day Pocahontas. Hmm. Yes, you're right. She would have been an object of curiosity merely to be studied and ridiculed. Mm. I was not thinking clearly. But did you never take a vacation and imagine all manner of changes that you would institute in your life on your return? Such was my mental state that night under the stars of that future time. What happened? Did she not want to come? I never found out, Bennett. I never found out. We set out for the Palace of Green Porcelain, and I made no mention to her of my plans. It's noon, day seven. The Palace of Green Porcelain is deserted and falling into ruin. Vincudato? I'm coming. Doors open and broken. Long gallery lit by many side windows. Reminiscent of a museum. Tiled floor thick with dust, la, leaking roof. La. Oh, this is interesting. Skeleton standing in the centre of the hall, lower part of a huge animal. Skull and upper bones lying on ground beside it. Museum hypothesis confirmed, I should say. Moving to wall now, sloping shelves. <laughs> yes. Not shelves, display cases. <coughs> Airtight by the look of it. Fossils inside well preserved. Some sort of latter day South Kensington. Some of the cases have been removed. By our underground friends, I should say. Very silent. Museum. Falanka. You say it. <laughs> Museum. <laughs> I went down a very ruinous aisle, parallel to the first hall I had entered. Apparently, this section was devoted to natural history, but everything has long passed out of recognition. Shriveled vestiges of stuffed animals. Then we came to a gallery of colossal proportions, but singularly ill lit. The floor ran down at a slight angle from the end in which I had entered, and white globes hung from the ceiling, which suggested that originally the place had been artificially lit. Machines. This is more like it. Greatly corroded, but some still fairly complete. There's one down here. It's a bit dark, but it seems to have been some sort of lifting device. Oh, Wiener, you scared me. It is indeed dark here. I hadn't noticed how steeply the floor slopes so that the gallery is partially underground. There is only a narrow line of daylight at the top of the windows, as in a basement. Canafrica. <laughs> Canafrica, <laughs> come, win. I still had no weapon, no refuge, and no means of making a fire. Step. Step. From one of the machines, there projected a lever not unlike those in a signal box. Ah, Wiener! Come, Afrika! There. That should be sufficient for any Morlock skull we might encounter. Hey! You want to feel this on your heads? 
Come, Rina. Going out of that gallery, we ascended a broad staircase. We came to what may have once been a gallery of technical chemistry. I went eagerly to every unbroken case. Uh-huh. Let's dance, Wiener. To the palanque. I'm dancing. Palanque. For this box of matches to have escaped the wear of time was most strange. As for me, it was a most fortunate thing. Yet, oddly enough, I found a far unlikelier substance. It was in a sealed jar, and I fancied at first it was paraffin wax. I was about to throw it away. Mm. But then I remembered that it was inflammable and burnt with a good bright flame. I'll keep it in my pocket. It will make an excellent candle. I went through gallery after gallery, dusty, silent, often ruinous. As evening drew on, my interest waned. We came to a little open court with three fruit trees. Arbole giudato? Ah, arbole. Trees. Frumos. Frumos ita After feasting, I saw that night was creeping up on us, and my inaccessible hiding place had yet to be found. Sunset, they said. It seems to me that the best thing we can do is pass the night in the open, protected by a fire. I have my matches, and I have the camphor in my pocket, and I have my bar of iron. I am determined to return to the Sphinx early tomorrow and tackle those bronze doors with it. We emerged from the palace. My plan was to go as far as possible that night, and I purposed pushing through the woods. As we went, I gathered any sticks or dried grass I saw, and presently had my arms full. Thus loaded, our progress was slower than I had anticipated. Wina, you are almost sick. Wina, tired. We have reached the wood and are looking into the darkness before us. Gorchudato! I know it's dark, but we have to carry on. Mergam, come on. Oh, can I, can I? Wina, you are freak. Mergam, Mergam. Oh, now what is it? It's more lucky. More lucky. There are three of them crouching in the bushes behind us. There's no need to be afraid. Can I freak? I have matches. My chase. The forest can only be rather less than a mile across. If we can get across it to the bare hillside, then I believe we will be safe. With the matches and camphor, I will contrive to keep our path illuminated. Although, if I am to have my hands free to flourish the light... I will have to abandon the firewood I have gathered. As I put it down, it came into my head to use it to amaze our friends behind. Match. Yes, match. And with the match, we light our firewood, so... No, Wina, keep back. Kana, Kana, hot, hot. Ha, hot. Come, Merkel. <laughs> yes, yes, it's like the sun. Now, come on. Mergam. Oh, can I, can I? I caught her up and plunged boldly into the wood. For a little way, the glare of the fire lit my path. Looking back, I could see that from my heap of sticks, the blaze had spread to some bushes, and a curved line of fire was creeping up the hill. Africa. There was sufficient light for me to avoid the trees. I had no hand free to strike a match. Upon my left arm I carried my little one. In my right hand I had my iron bar. Or lucky. Mergen. There were evidently several of the Morlocks, and they were closing in upon me. Indeed, in another minute, I felt a tug on my coat. <laughs> 
Wiener, get off her! Hey! Hey! It was time for a match. But to get one, I must put her down. There. Ah! Leave her! Wiener, can I sneak her? Wiener! Hey! Hey! I hastily take a lump of camphor from my pocket and prepare to light it. Wiener! Hey! Wiener, open your eyes! She's lying, clutching my feet, and quite motionless. Wiener! I light the camphor and fling it to the ground. Come on, Marigold. Now, I'm here. Come on. Now, which way? In maneuvering with my matches and Wiener, I had turned myself several times, and now I had not the faintest idea in what direction lay my path. I determined to build a fire and encamp where we were. As my first lump of camphor waned, I put Wiener upon a turfy bowl and began collecting sticks and leaves. The camphor flickered and went out. Hey! Hey! Two white forms that had been approaching Wiener dashed hastily away. One was so blinded by the light that he came straight for me. I felt his bones grind under the blow of my fist. I lit another piece of camphor and went on gathering my bonfire, dragging down branches. Very soon I had a choking smoky fire of green wood and dry sticks and could economize with my camphor. Then I turned to where Wiener lay beside my iron mace. Wiener, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have brought you here. Chutado is stupid. Freja Chutado. No, Chutado Frumos. Beautiful. <laughs> I'm sorry, Wiener. <laughs> La Lanka Chutado. <What>? Sing. <laughs> Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder how you are. I felt very weary, and the fire would not need replenishing for an hour or so. The smoke made me heavy, and the vapor of camphor was in the air. I seemed to just nod and open my eyes. No. All was dark, and the Morlocks had their hands upon me. I had slept, and the fire had gone out. I hastily felt in my pocket for the matchbox. Gone. Yes. They've taken my matches. They're all over me. I'm caught by the neck, by the hair, pulling me down. Little teeth nipping at me. I roll over, and as I do, my hand comes against my iron lever. I struggle up, shaking the human rats from me, thrusting where I judge their faces might be. I stand with my back to a tree, swinging the iron bar before me. Wiener and I are lost. Death is upon me, but I am determined to make the Morlocks pay for their meat. I scared them off for the moment. I can see three battered Morlocks on my feet. There seems to be some sort of light. The Morlocks are running from something, the smell of burning wood. Red sparks drifting across a gap of starlight. Stepping out from behind my tree, I see the flames of the burning forest. My first fire is coming after me. Wiener! Wiener! She is gone. So with my iron bar still gripped, I follow in the Morlock's path. At last I emerge upon a small open space. A Morlock blunders past me and goes on straight into the fire. The whole space is as bright as day. In the center is a hillock. 
Some 30 or 40 Morlocks are gathered on a hillside fenced in by flames, dazzled by light and heat, blundering hither and thither. They keep running towards me. They don't seem to see me at all. With this realization, I struck out at them no more. Wiener! Wiener! She was gone. At last, I sat down on the summit of the hillock and watched this strange, incredible company. Blind things, groping to and fro. The glare of the fire beats on them. Smoke trailing across the sky, and through it shine two stars as though they belonged to another universe. Wiener. The Morlocks are putting their heads down. They're rushing into the flames. God, if this is a nightmare, let me awake. <laughs> At last, Came the white light of day. There was no trace of her. Wiener. It was plain that they had left her poor little body in the forest. She had escaped the awful fate to which she seemed destined. Day eight. Have tied some grass about my feet. Ah, can now make out the palace of green porcelain. So I've got my bearings for the White Sphinx. I'm limping across smoking ashes towards the hiding place of my time machine. I felt immense wretchedness for the horrible death of little Wiener. Now, in this familiar room, it is like the sorrow of a dream. But that morning it left me absolutely lonely again terribly alone. I began to think of this house of mine, of this fireside, of you, my friends, and with such thoughts came a longing that was pain. I'll top up the fellow's glass. Ah. Poor Wiener. Hmm. Look what I found when I changed my jacket. Here. Oh. Oh. What sort of flowers are they? Flowers from the future, apparently. Not unlike very large white mallows. Mm. It's all that I have of her. Uh, Morga, is that right? Indeed, yes. Frumosica Morga. Huh. But did you get your time machine back? Clearly he did. Well, yes, but how? About eight or nine in the morning, I walked up to the same seat of yellow metal from which I had viewed the world upon the evening of my arrival. How wrongly I saw it that evening. It's the same beautiful scene, the same abundant foliage, the same splendid palaces and magnificent ruins, the same silver river running between its fertile banks. The same beautiful people in their pretty clothes. They are bathing in exactly the place where I saved Wiener. And like blots upon the landscape rise the cupolas above the wells that lead to the underworld. I understood now what all the beauty of the upper world people concealed. Very pleasant is their day as pleasant as the day of the cattle in the field. Like cattle, they know of no enemies and provide against no needs. And their end is the same as cattle. How brief has been the dream of the human intellect. It has committed suicide. It set itself steadfastly towards comfort and ease. But then the feeding of the underworld, however it was affected, became disjointed. 
and when other meat failed them. The underworld has turned to what old habit had hitherto forbidden. After the fatigues, excitements and terrors of the past days, this seat and the tranquil view and the warm sunlight were very pleasant, in spite of my grief. Spreading myself out upon the turf, I had a long and refreshing sleep. I awoke a little before sunset. Feeling in my pockets, I found some loose matches. The box must have leaked before it was lost. Stretching myself, I came on down the hill towards the White Sphinx, my crowbar in one hand and the other hand in my pocket playing with my matches. Good gracious. The bronze doors are open. The bronze panels seem to have slid down into grooves. Within, I could see that there was a small apartment and on a raised place in the corner of this was the time machine. Yes! Here, after all my elaborate preparations for the siege of the White Sphinx, was meek surrender. I threw my iron bar away. I had the small levers in my pocket, and I stooped towards the portal. Maybe no surrender. They think to lure me into a trap, little knowing that my machine is not to be confined by physical obstacles. I stepped through the bronze frame. <laughs> Yes. Hmm. Carefully oiled and cleaned. Been trying to grasp its purpose, have you? As I stood and examined it, finding a pleasure in the mere touch of the contrivance, the thing I had expected happened. The bronze panel slid out of the ground and darkness descended. I had only to fix on the levers and then depart like a ghost. Very calmly, I tried to strike the match. I had overlooked one little thing. The matches were of that abominable kind that light only on the box. Damnation! Get off! I made a sweeping blow in the dark at them with the levers and began to scramble onto the saddle of the machine. They grasped persistently for the levers, and I fought against them as I felt for the studs over which they fitted. No! One, they almost got away from me. As it slipped from my hand, I had to butt in the dark with my head to recover it. It was a nearer thing than the fight in the forest, but at last, the lever was fixed and pulled over. Now! The clinging hand slipped from me. The darkness presently fell from my eyes. I found myself in the same grey light and tumult I have already described. Hands spinning backwards on the dials. The dim shadows of houses passing, changing. Slackening speed now. Now our own petty and familiar architecture. The thousands dial running back to the starting point. Day flapping slower and slower. Then the old walls of the laboratory came round me. Very gently now, I slowed the mechanism down. Mrs. Watchett glided quietly up the room, back foremost, and disappeared behind the door by which she had previously entered. Just before that, I seemed to see you, Wells. Me? Just for a moment. Around me was my old workshop, exactly as it had been, and yet not exactly. The thing had started from the southeast corner of the laboratory. It had come to rest again in the northwest, the exact distance from my little lawn to the pedestal of the White Sphinx. Oh, gracious. Presently, I got up and came through the passage here, limping because my heel was still painful. I heard your voices in the clatter of plates. Then I sniffed good wholesome meat. I'd have thought you might have become a permanent vegetarian after your experience. I cannot expect you to believe it. 
take it as a lie or a prophecy. Uh, where are the matches? Uh, here. Hmm. To tell you the truth, I hardly believe it myself. And yet... These flowers, old boy, I'd like to find the genus. May I have them? Certainly not. Where did you really get them? They were put into my pocket by Wiener when I travelled into time. Or was it all a dream? I'm damned if it isn't all going. He caught up the lamp swiftly and carried it flaring red through the door into the corridor. We followed him. There, in the flickering light of the lamp, was the machine, sure enough. I put out my hand and felt the rail of it. It's all right now. The story I told you was true. I'm sorry to have brought you out here in the cold. I'm hanged if it isn't a quarter to one. Where's my coat? You know, I think you're suffering from overwork, old man. Yes, I am. <laughs> you coming, Wells? Yes. There's plenty of cabs at the station. Overwork. <laughs> yes, that's it. Good night, old fellow. Good night. <sighs> what a gaudy lie. Perhaps. And so we went out towards the station at Richmond to find our cab. Quite a story. <laughs> You're humouring me, I know, my dear. You think I've finally succumbed to senility. Not at all. You know, I still haven't told you the strangest and most shocking part of the story. You mean the ending that you were persuaded to abandon? Uh, that too, yes. I'm listening. Still hoping to get copy from this? Maybe. Hmm. Uh, the cold is getting to my old bones now. I suggest we go down into the warm. Let's hope the Luftwaffe will leave us in peace tonight. <laughs> Come, mind your step. Can I get you a nightcap? A small scotch? Thank you. You know, I lay awake most of that night thinking about the time traveller's story. I determined to go next day and see him again. He was on his way to his laboratory but took me into the smoking room. He had a small camera under one arm and a knapsack under the other. I was wondering... Yes? If I could hear some of the recordings from the future. Oh, big disappointment, Wells. My recording machine failed to work. I got the ratio of benzene and beeswax on the discs wrong. Ah, I see. But I think I've managed to correct that problem. Now, I need to get on. I'm frightfully busy. Uh, did you really travel through time? If you stop to lunch, I'll prove it. Specimens and all. It will only take half an hour. I consented to wait, and he went down the corridor. I heard the door of the laboratory slam. I seated myself in a chair and took up a daily paper. What was he going to do before lunchtime? After a while, I was reminded by an advertisement that I had promised to meet my publisher for lunch. I got up and went down the corridor and took hold of the handle. A gust of air whirled round me as I opened the door. The time traveller was not there. For a moment, I seemed to see a ghostly, indistinct figure sitting in a whirling mass of black and brass. But this phantasm vanished as I rubbed my eyes. The door into the garden opened. Ah, Mrs. Watchit, did my friend come out that way? No, sir. He was in here a moment ago. Lunch will be ready soon. Beef stew. At the risk of disappointing my publisher, I stayed on for half an hour. An hour. 
The stew's going cold. Uh, all right. It's not all right. It's not all right at all. I was about to give up my vigil when I felt a slight breath of wind and something glowed on the desk in front of the window. I recognised the outline of the little prototype machine that our friend had shown us just over a week before, the one that my finger had sent on its travels. It gradually became more distinct, glimmering brass and ivory, and then materialised fully. H.G., this wasn't in your original tale. No, well, you see, I would have had to provide the proof that my story was true if I had written that down. <laughs> proof? Yes. <laughs> what the hell is that? Tied to the saddle of the prototype was a disc wrapped in a note. On this paper, he had written instructions for the processing of the disc and the whereabouts of the machine on which it could be played. This primitive phonograph, which I found in the cupboard indicated by the note. I spent some time processing the disc, and later that afternoon, I was ready to let it play. And you want me to believe that this disc is going to bring back the sounds of the future? Wouldn't you like to know what the future holds, Martha? Especially now, when our race seems on the brink of self-destruction. I'm not sure. Listen. Thousands dialed, sweeping round as fast as second hand of watch. Peculiar change sweeping over appearance of things. Palpitating greyness growing darker. Blinking succession of day and night is returned, even though I have not slowed the pace of my travel. Passage of the sun across the sky now seems to stretch through centuries. Sun has ceased to set altogether, simply rises and falls. I see. Earth has now come to rest with one face to the sun. I shall now gradually slow. Ah, dim outline of desolate beach. Stopping now. Reddish rocks and green vegetation like moss or lichen. Plants that grow in perpetual twilight. No breakers, no waves. Breathing very fast. Air rarefied, I presume. Little animals hopping on the lichen. Seem to be some sort of herbivores. Descendants of our rabbits, perhaps. <laughs> Huge white thing like a butterfly circling in the sky. Reddish rock near me moving. Some sort of crab-like animal. Large as a table. Big claws swaying, long antennae. Abominable sense of desolation hanging over the world. These herbivores look like they might be quite nutritious. And they seem to have little fear of me. There's one just nearby. Maybe a source of food if I don't manage to return to my own time. Carefully picking up a rock. Just getting closer to examine... The my God. It's not a rabbit. It's humanoid. A tiny little human. Can this be? Is this the descendant of the Eloi? Something ticking my cheek, and another on my neck, thread-like thing. Another monster crab standing just behind me, claws descending on me, must get up. Returning to my machine. In the saddle now. The little thing that I killed is being ingested by the giant crab. The cycle of life keeps turning, even in these last days of the planet. He seems to have stopped recording at this point, must have turned the thing off. Starts again in a moment. No wonder your publisher wasn't keen on that. Humankind ending up as fodder for giant crabs.
have traveled 30 million years into future. Crawling crabs disappeared. Beach now lifeless, bitter cold. Rare white flakes eddying down. Nothing moving in earth or sky or sea. Just green slime and silence. All sounds of man, the bleating of sheep, cries of birds, hum of insects, all gone. Black object crawling out of the sea. No, my imagination, darkness falling, some sort of eclipse. Yes, black object the size of football moving up the beach. Must leave here, must find Wiener, must... H.G., why this elaborate hoax? Let me examine that machine. How did this prototype you talk about return with a recording? I can only assume that in some part of the distant future our time traveller came across a piece of his own past in the shape of his prototype. His note does not explain, although he asked me to send it out once more on its travels once I had retrieved the note and the disc. So if your time traveller is to be believed... Our downfall is slow and inevitable. Our planet dies over 30 million years from now, in spite of the weapons that are being developed and the wars that are being fought in our own time. Ah, yes. But for it all to end like that, it is shocking. Certainly not the optimistic wells that the world knows and loves. But perhaps it is age that breeds pessimism, my dear. And now this pessimistic old man is very tired. Yes. And your reputation must be defended. Who knows what my biographers would make of it if you were to stay the night. Good night, H.G. <laughs> yes, of course. I'll see you out. If I were to give you the recording from the future, what would you do with it? You mean if it were indeed a message from the future? Would you broadcast it on the home service and tell mankind what awaits him? Would you give it to me? I would rather our species ended its story in dignity, kindliness and generosity, and not like drunken cowards in a daze or poisoned rats in a sack. But this is a matter of individual predilection for everyone to decide for himself. Who am I to take that choice away from man by giving him this live broadcast from the end of time? Such was my thinking anyway on that afternoon, all those years ago, in the Time Traveller's Laboratory. When I met my publisher the following day, I told him about a story that I was writing but made no mention of the recording. Perhaps the time traveller came to the same decision. Which is why the prototype and the recording were the only messages he sent from the future. Mm. Or perhaps he found Wiener. <laughs> perhaps he did, my dear. So many stars. One advantage of the blackouts, we get to see the stars. Do not believe what I say at the last. Believe what I wrote when I was in my prime and hopeful. I do not see why life should be judged by its last trailing thread of vitality. Good night, H.G. Good night. In The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, The Time Traveller was played by Robert Glenister and H.G. Wells by William Gaunt. The Young Wells was Gunnar Cawthry and Martha Don LaHughes. Philby was played by Stephen Critchlow, Bennett by Chris Pavlo and Wiener by Jill Cardo. 
Other parts were played by Robert Lonsdale, Manjeet Mann, Inam Mirza, and Dan Starkey. The music was by John Nichols, and technical presentation was by Mike Etherden, Vanessa Spring, and Alison Griffiths. The Time Machine was dramatized by Philip Osmond and directed by Jeremy Mortimer. The Time Machine is published by BBC Audiobooks.